So thank you for having us. Recognizing we're a little bit delayed here. We'll see what we can do to wrap this up in three hours, maybe four hours um, as we go forward. So uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Robert Bartlett. I'm the uh, Chief Administrative Officer for the District of West Vancouver. I won't go through the rest of my profile, and I'll try and keep this on track. I'm your moderator for this afternoon, uh, for this morning. So really, what are we here to look at? Um, focus is the ESGs. We have a wonderful panel that I'll introduce in a, in a moment. And when we look at those, there's six principles that have been through the UN resolution. Um, and they really look at the incorporation of the ESGs as an investment analysis, we really look at active owners, and really what I take from those six principles is how do we monitor, how do we collaborate, and how do we really show the investment in ESGs? I mean, for me, this topic has been around for 10, 15 years, and there's always discussion. Is it working? Like, how do we get the benefit from it? And I think over the course of this conference, what we've seen is it's still a topic for discussion. So I'm going to keep my intro kind of, kind of brief. Within the government sector, which is where I sit, spent 25 years, Really, we look at the environmental trends. It's an ongoing issue that we've heard about the whole, you know, throughout the whole conference when we've got to the end of today. In, in the District of West Vancouver, we looked at environmental levies, climate adaptation, infrastructure protection, asset management, and the metrics that surround that. For the social divide, we have a complex system of wealthy and less wealthy. So how do we look at the social kind of need and the social good as we look at ethical investment, social services? Um, and the investment in reconciliation, all of which play I think, uh, a, a very significant part. And through to governance, we've heard a lot of discussion around the integration of municipal, provincial, federal governance as a key partner in delivering against ESGs. So today, uh, hopefully, we're going to touch on all of those things. And if we don't, I'm speaking later this afternoon to come kind of into that. So um, we're lucky to have a kind of an integrated panel here, and I won't take much longer. I'm going to ask now, I'm going to go through the panel, get some introductions. They'll speak each have five minutes each. They'll come up to the, the podium here, get to understand where they're coming from, and then we have some questions. There's some really good questions. I'll try and get through as many as possible of those questions for our panel. So in no particular order, I'm going to ask the first panel member to come up. Um, I'll introduce just their name and title, and the rest they'll do in their, in their bio. So Nicola Richard, there's actually in Global Asset Management for Canada. everyone, I'm happy to be here, and uh, I thought I would use uh, the company that I work for, which is Desjardins, uh, as a case study for the topic today. Uh, Desjardins, you know, as a, as a, as a responsible uh, finance institution, as a large cooperative, uh, broadly uh, in a lot of different areas, but specifically uh, in investments, which happens to be uh, my, my specialty. Uh, we are signatories of the principles for responsible investment uh, of the United Nations, but also uh, the, uh, the corresponding principles for insurance uh, as well as banking. And the mission uh, at Desjardins is the well being of our members and the communities they live in. So, very hard to say that sustainable finance is at the heart of our mission it is of course at the heart of our mission and we're doing everything we can to continue to move the needle and uh and continue to be uh, a leader in the financial marketplace um, back to the topic of investments um, we are both an asset owner and an asset manager i'll just spend a minute or two on each of those uh, roles so as an asset owner we have very large portfolios for uh, two insurance companies in our pension plan and of course we want to align uh, these portfolios to the overall corporate mission uh, on sustainability so that means a lot of things but let me just give you a couple of examples first uh, we are on a path to net zero uh, so that means that uh, we want to decarbonize or reduce the carbon footprint uh, of our portfolios over time uh, in, uh, in all sectors uh, of the economy in 2050, but uh, in a couple of key sectors by 2040. Um, this, is, this is not just uh, an aspirational goal, something that is nice to have in, in a, over a long period, but we have very specific yearly targets uh, 
uh, and our portfolio manager's compensation is impacted by whether or not they reach their, uh, their annual goals. Other example, if we want the, the uh, totality of our asset classes that we manage to be subject to the uh, mission uh, on environment, social, and governance. And so we always talk about you know, public equities and, and fixed income uh, as important uh, ESG components. But the reality is that uh, you know, institutional portfolios are broadly diversified. There's a lot of alternative investments, and these two have to participate in the mission. So, uh, or just to give you an example on infrastructure, uh, we're aiming to have a dominant share of uh, our infrastructure investments uh, in renewable energy. On the asset manager side, my job is to make sure that we have the resources and the capabilities uh, to help uh, our clients meet their objectives, whether it's uh, Desjardins' own accounts, or own assets, as I just described, or assets that are uh, managed on behalf of institutional or retail clients. There's three things that are really important for that. Uh, first, we need to accompany our clients. Uh, they have varied needs and um, they want to uh, deliver uh, ESG objectives in different ways based on the, their different circumstances. Education is key and being a, a strong partner uh, is very, very important. The second part is we need to make it work uh, in a practical manner. I talked about decarbonization before. Well, what's the data we're using? How does it work? How do we measure it? How often is it uh, updated? Uh, how do we track it over time? So that's the kind of transparency that's needed uh, to make uh, a strategy uh, live over time. And the final piece is we have to earn the trust. And for that, um, it's not good enough to say, you know, we're going to manage a couple of responsible investment portfolios with our left hand and, uh, and do everything else the same way as we always have. It has to be, um, or, or, or treat um, ESG as some sort of compliance process where you exclude a few uh, securities based on you know, certain things you don't like, but everything else works the same. It has to be a complete and thorough commitment for, for the, the whole asset manager. Uh, we have to uh, make sure that uh, ESG considerations are integrated in all asset classes and everything that we do and really everything that we are as well as an organization. So that's a, it's a matter of credibility uh, to earn the trust of our partners. So, it's an exciting journey, and uh, there are a lot of challenges. We heard a lot about that, but I'm, I'm uh, happy to help contribute to solve that. Thank you so much. So the, our next speaker is Michael Roth, President and CEO of the Canadian Finance and Leasing Association of Canada. Thanks. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for having me here. I'm very happy to uh, be able to I'll try and keep my uh, my remarks brief to, to try and catch a little bit of time as we move forward. So as uh, Robert introduced me, I'm with the Canadian Finance Leasing Association. We represent the equipment, automotive, and fleet uh, industries in Canada. Collectively, that's about a $440 billion industry with approximately $139 billion annual churn in the industry. Increasingly, I'm seeing uh, ESG uh, shifting away from a, uh, a box ticking exercise or a nice to have to becoming a competitive advantage amongst our members. I've been with the association five years and to share a quick anecdote, when I first joined the association, we, we ourselves have an annual conference. Um, we had it in Vancouver and I was speaking with some of the senior leadership and uh, mentioned why don't we get uh, David Suzuki leading uh, environmental activists to come speak. And uh, the reaction was such that I thought this might be a very short term career for me at the CFLA. However, that very same leadership now um, is, is driving a, uh, an ESG agenda, uh, such that um, uh, our association working with our partners, both in the UK and America, are now working on a, a pan-industry paper uh, on ESG initiatives to uh, provide some thought leadership to the industry. Increasingly, we're seeing investment in, in uh, environmental and sustainable technologies. Um, recently, uh, uh, research has indicated that um, carbon 
neutral technologies have reached about a seven hundred and fifty five billion dollar level of investment, which is a twenty five percent increase from twenty 2020 twenty to twenty twenty one. So it's you know things are moving in, in the right direction. And as I said earlier remarks, uh, we're moving away from a, a nice to have to definitely a, uh, a competitive advantage approach. Um, as my anecdote, I hope also represents uh, the, the the shift from uh, for for ESG mindset is not only a bottom driven by the, the consumers that we serve, but also from a leadership top-down approach as well. So we hopefully transition into a, a, a much more sustainable future. So I'll conclude my remarks there to get us back on time. Thank you and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're catching up time here yeah, in a good group of guys. Um, so next up uh, from the from the uh, podium here is uh, Lenka Martinique, managing partner, Nordis Capital Canada. I will also keep the theme of trying to be brief. Um, our firm, Nordis Capital, is a small asset manager, emerging manage, managing uh, emerging asset manager in Quebec. We focus exclusively on uh, ESG thematics, so environmental, social, and governance thematics. We basically start from a top down, top, top, very broad macro world and find uh, investment ideas that we expect will uh, play out in the future, ESG topics that we think are actually investable. Because it's not true that um, all, all things that we worry about in that list of SDGs is actually going to be solved by things like capital markets. So we try to focus on the things where we have the most bang for our buck. Um, we actually run a, a, a sister firm called Sustainable Market Strategies, which does all of the research for us, and then we essentially do the asset management for Nordis Capital. Um, what I want to talk about very quickly is the difference between ESG and impact or sustainability, because I think this is a very important topic uh, today in terms of where the investment industry is at. We very much appreciated the comments by Nicola um, just seeing, um, preceding me. The idea here is that ESG is this, it was at one point a box ticking exercise. Um, it has now gone into something that is called more ESG integration, but there's still a very big difference between ESG and sustainability or impact. And I think there was a speaker yesterday from, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, Upper Stage Capital, who had a really excellent um, way of describing it. ESG is an input to businesses, whereas impact is an output. And so what that really means is that ESG historically has been a risk management tool. A business or an investor is going to ask the question, what environmental, social, or governance risks are there that I need to think about that might have an impact on my risk adjusted returns. Um, impact, on the other hand, is asking a different question. As an impact investor, you're really asking the question, what does this product or service do for the world? So what, how am I having an impact uh, positively on the rest of the world? And these are, I think, um, quite important differences. I would say that ESG today can absolutely have uh, real world outcomes. So it is a very powerful risk management tool for investors. The fact that it encapsulates what um, broad majority of stakeholders are interested in and are aware of means that companies will eventually change their, um, their way of doing business to reflect what society wants. So I like to use the example of finance is notoriously uh, a, a discipline um, that is uh, fairly male oriented. Um, but it's become very, very clear in the last couple of years between abortion rights, the Me Too, all of these things, that, that investors are asking the question, what are your businesses doing? What are, what are our portfolio companies doing to make sure that there are women in senior management positions? And the number of women in, in senior management positions in the last couple of years, board roles, etc., has just skyrocketed. Because that, pre that pressure, that feedback mechanism through investors, through other stakeholders, has forced businesses to move in a certain direction. So ESG can absolutely have a real world outcome, but we need to be very, very clear here that this is very different than actually seeking companies that look for impact. So we, at our shop, we care a lot about double materiality. We're looking for companies that um, score very, very well on ESG issues. So they're doing all of the right things that you would expect from good companies. But on top of that, we're looking for those companies that actually are providing products and services that, that will help to um, solve environmental and social challenges in the future. So I just think it's an important sort of starting point for this, this discussion so that we know exactly what we're talking about and what public markets can actually achieve. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so the next person we have in, uh, in person on the stage here, and then we're going to go to two people online. So please to welcome Harley Gold, Managing Director of Peak Hill Capital in Canada.
Great, thank you, Lenko. That um, that was uh, very insightful, and I enjoyed that very much. As um, I started PQL Capital about three years ago, and had had a couple of those ideas in mind on the SG side and impact side. Uh, we're, we're a real estate asset management firm um, active in Canada in the U.S. Um, we're, we're, we have a debt program in Canada with about 400 loans, uh, primarily focused in the multifamily space, uh, CMHC insured loans, so we're a CMHC insured lender uh, doing term loans. Um, as well as construction loans. Um, as an example, we have about 25 construction loans across Canada right now on the affordable side. On the new MLI, um, CMHC programs are very active in that space, and uh, we're looking to, uh, to grow that space. And um, we, we deal with clients from a million dollar loan up to a hundred million dollar loan. So smaller borrowers, very large borrowers. And, um, and we, we, uh, we do have a young team and we feel we do have, we do have an impact um, with our clients to help them uh, understand the space sort of the opportunities and uniqueness of the space and the affordable housing space and how that's growing across Canada. So um, we're, we're quite pleased with that. Um, we also have um, an equity program that we're quite active in the U.S. side on, and um, we've got quite a large um, affordable housing project in, in New York City that, we're, that, um, that we partnered with a U.S. life insurance company on uh, in their impact fund. Um, so we're an equity investor in that, uh, in that development project, and we're looking to continue to look for similar type of projects uh, throughout the United States. And um, we're also looking to grow um, on, our, um, on, our, on our debt side in Canada. And um, we're working with um, CMHC with their innovation fund right now in terms of launching a new, um, a new limited partnership uh, debt fund that will focus on the, on the housing affordable space, uh, focused on bridge loans, on land loans, on top up equity investments um, in, um, on the private side as opposed to the public side. So we are an active participant in the Canada Mortgage Bond Program, which, which is public, uh, which, which are loans we originate, we often sell back to CMHC that ultimately gets sold around the world. But, uh, but we're looking at doing a more, um, you know, a, a, another type of product that has a lot of more flexibility to do the bridge loans, a little bit of top of equity to uh, help that developer um, you know, stretch a little bit more to, uh, to do the project as well as work with NFPs as well. Um, in, uh, in that sector as well that don't necessarily have the knowledge base per se or depth of team that needs a little bit more expertise in terms of project assistance and help um, and uh, sort of get that project uh, um, over, over the goal line. So uh, that's something as well that uh, we're looking to grow uh, our relationships in the NFP space um, to, uh, to bring those, those projects to fruition across the country. Thanks. <laughs> So, um, we have hopefully two, but definitely one person online that's going to join us as well. So, please uh, introduce Keith Matthew, the former Chief Assembly of First Nations, uh, the CEO of Scalp Business Services Canada, and President um, and Chief Executive Officer. So, hopefully, we have um, Keith Matthew online here. Here I am. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. We hear you. Is it Can clear? You hear me? Okay, good. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce myself. I'm from the uh, Shuswap community of the uh, First Nation in Central British Columbia, Canada. And uh, currently, I'm on the uh, following boards for for my community. I'm on the community. Hi, board. Keith. Keith, can you hear me? Your yeah. your mic seems to be unmuted, but it, it's not coming through. No, I the participants it seems like can hear me with your your input. The participants can hear me. I still cannot hear you. Though. Uh, try, try muting yourself and unmuting. Hello. I hear. No, no voice coming through. Very yet. clear. Very clear. The sound is very clear. Do you have um, earphones plugged in? Yes. It might help to take out earphones, your earphones, and just talk through the computer. Okay, I'll try that. Hello, can you hear me? No, still no audio. At online, we can hear you. Yeah, people online can hear me. Yes. Keith, maybe what we'll do is, is we'll, we'll, we'll all hear you. fix it and in the meantime, um, okay, great. move to discussion. Okay, so 
we'll do. Yeah, we'll, we're going to look at some questions now. Um, and then hopefully we can come back to Keith and involve Keith in those questions as we go forward. So what we're trying to do here is we're going to pose some questions and we'll get two of the panel panelists to answer the same question. So you can get a different perspective on the same answer. And if we have one, that's great. And if not, we can keep going through the questions. So the first question I'm going to turn to Nicola. Um, there is a perspective that responsible investment has a cost and low returns. Is this true? So I'm going to ask Nicola to answer this and then I'm going to ask Lenka to answer the same question. So let's see how we go. Um, yes, so uh, you hear a lot about this notion that, um, you know, it, as a responsible investor, you're leaving returns on the table to be a responsible investor. And I think that's a really, um, you know, unfortunate way of looking at it. I think that more and more um, it's becoming clear um, that, you know, ESG factors have, the, have direct impact on the risks and the returns of investments. It's part of our fiduciary duty as portfolio managers to incorporate these risks and these return opportunities into our work. If we didn't do that, I, I'd go as far as saying that we're not doing our job. So ESG is increasingly quantified and part of our work and you know, ignoring it doesn't make any sense nowadays. Now, at times, there will be sectors that will do better than others. When the price of oil goes up, you know, it's going to be beneficial for the oil companies. But um, so far, uh, we have noticed that there is absolutely no uh, chips left on the table as an investor. And in fact, it's been quite the opposite. So then I'm going to pose the same. See if we have a different perspective going. So the question again, is there that perspective that responsible investment has a cost and those low returns? And so is that true? Yeah, unfortunately, you're not going to get a different uh, perspective because we are speaking to, you know, the converted already. Um, but what I would say is that what we notice in our work particularly is that ESG is so developed now that um, it's not really going to help you boost your returns because all large cap companies are already doing ESG risk management extremely well. So what it, it definitely will, do, will help you avoid controversy. So if you find companies that are not reporting correctly or not, not addressing uh, particular material risks to their businesses, you will uh, absolutely be at risk of, of picking a loser. Um, so it's not a symmetric outcome, I would say. Um, at this point, the ESG is mature enough that it's not going to give you extra returns, but it certainly will help you avoid the duds. Um, the other thing that I'd like to say about this whole you know, diversification, can you, can you have you know, superior or just as good returns if you include sectors. Um, you know, every portfolio manager has constraints. Uh, they may not be ESG constraints, but they'll be something else. If you're a fixed income manager and you live in Canada, you have a geographic bias, you must have a certain amount of Canadian bonds, for example. And so to say that, you know, that you can't make um, decent returns because you may have some ESG constraint, I think is just nonsense because our jobs are full of constraints. Um, you know, the, the, the real world kind of parallel is when I go to the supermarket, I, you know, ban certain cereals from my kids. Can we still eat healthy? Absolutely. I would say there's just way too much out there. Um, we can still build really nice portfolios with excluding um, loads and loads of companies that may not be up to par in this gene. So much. Um, oh, excellent. Yeah, we can, why not? Let's jump back and forth. So, um, thank you so much for that. So, we, we have Keith online now. So I'd love to hear Keith for, for five minutes, and then we'll go back into the questions for the panel. Keith, good morning. Excellent. Can you hear me now? Absolutely, yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Um, as I mentioned before, my name is Keith Matthew. I'm a First Nations uh, person from the Shushwab community of the Sem First Nation in central British Columbia. And uh, currently, I'm the chair of uh, the Community Futures Development Corp for Central Ontario First Nations. I sit on the National Aboriginal Capital Corporation. Uh, I'm on the First Nations Infrastructure Institute, and uh, I'm working on buying the uh, Trans Mountain uh, Pipeline. So those are just some of the things that I'm doing. I do have a presentation, but I won't bother putting it up. Uh, I want to, uh, again, acknowledge uh, the, the Indigenous people of uh, the uh, area that you're currently uh, doing your presentation from. And uh, I will move on to uh, 
you know, the, uh, the central part of my presentation. So as a leader, I've always viewed entrepreneurship and economic development as a top priority for the improvement of the living conditions in Indigenous peoples, communities, and to recover from colonization. So as an Indigenous person, uh, we are actively involved in the process of reconciliation with Canada and uh, working hard towards uh, making our lives better for ourselves. So uh, one of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action uh, was to ensure that Aboriginal peoples have equitable access to jobs, training and education opportunities in the corporate sector and that Aboriginal communities gain long-term sustainable benefits from economic development projects. So uh, that was one of the uh, more important or salient uh, recommendations from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, in addition, the equity of First Nations Ec Economic Development Corporation represents equity for the coming generations to build on. As an example of this, St Statistics Canada projects that the Indigenous population will grow by more than 50% by 2040, 2041, pardon me, double the rate of the non-Indigenous population. Uh, the next, uh, I guess, uh, area that I'd like to talk about is enterprises for Indigenous communities vitality. When owned by, uh, when Indigenous people own small, medium, and uh, medium enterprises, they create wealth and jobs for our people and boost the vitality and dynamic of our communities. They also have a larger impact by bringing pride to families and improving community health. Uh, again, focusing on SMEs, for instance, in terms of contribution of uh, social fabric and PRI and ESGs, a coffee shop owned by an Indigenous business owner creates a place where people can gather and chat over coffee. An IT firm can create a few internships for school on site in the community. A fishing plant allows to keep an ancestral practice alive while contributing to the local food security and so on. Access to capital. Over 50% of indigenous peoples entrepreneurs need to rely on their savings only 19% obtained a business uh, loan. So further to that, to pursue economic development projects and create enterprises, First Nations need access to capital, which for reasons associated to colonization and the Indian Act is a main obstacle faced by indigenous peoples, entrepreneurs. Next, uh, next point, environmental social governance performance. As such, financial institutions from the private and public sectors bring a significant contribution towards an indigenous economic development rec and reconciliation, which aligned with the principles of responsible, which aligns with the principles of responsible investment and the ESGs. Access to capital, a national Aboriginal capital corporation uh, and Aboriginal financial institutions. Access to capital remained a major obstacle for Indigenous entrepreneurs. The network of Aboriginal financial institutions of NACA offer a remedy to this obstacle since the 1980s with terms and flexibility tailored to meet the needs of Indigenous entrepreneurs across Canada. AFI results, Initial investment of $240 million, 42,000 loans to Indigenous entrepreneurs, totaling more than $2.3 billion. We have recently created the Indigenous Growth Fund and uh, just very briefly, strong support from this expertise and experience. In 2021, the Growth Fund was launched to, uh, to increase the capacity of the FIs Aboriginal financial institutions to support First Nations, Métis and Inuit entrepreneurs and enterprises and accelerate the economic development in Indigenous communities. Again, just to uh, uh, wrap up the Indigenous Growth Fund, it allows the AFI, uh, Aboriginal financial institutions network to assist expanding businesses owned by Indigenous peoples and their entrepreneurs and allowing them to make loans uh, available to more of them, as well as to larger business opportunities. 
investors, public and private foundations, indigenous trusts, corporate Canada, other institutional investors. The fund is structured to accept investments from accredited investors, such as the ones that I mentioned. And that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Keith, for being a part of our, our panel. Um, so, we're going to flick back to the questions and hopefully keep Keith, uh, Keith here as well. Um, next question is really looking at this concept that many of us are better at greenwashing. So, the question to the panel, and I'm going to uh, move to Harley first and then to, to, to Lenka. Um, we hear a lot about greenwashing. What is your perspective on it and how do investors guard against it? So, to Harley first. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, there's certainly certainly that does go on in the industry as as things have been emerging over the last you know 15 20 years um but but i would look at the, the positives is that a lot of a lot of companies are are doing the best they can to to understand the space and understand the metrics and understand how things are are measured and and it's still an evolving process and um you know as ourselves as, as a new emerging manager there's lots of things that we're learning and different guidelines and things of that nature that uh, we're doing the best and and it is it is coming through sort of the younger generation within organizations of how to how to address all the esg you know metrics and and risk risks associated and so forth so um it, it it's all for the positive for sure in, in terms of the momentum that's being built um as 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 this evolves and um it's it's you know even if there is is a company that one could think is is greenwashing an initiative. Um, so what? At least it's it's moving in the positive direction. I mean, maybe maybe they're doing it for ulterior motive, motives and so forth. But I think there's a lot of momentum in the industry, and I think investors are really smart and they can sort of see through things. And and things are being challenged a lot more, and questions um, are coming from investors. And there's lots of great consultants out there that can help investors understand. Um, and underwrite companies and underwrite managers and understand um, how things are, are working and to, to, to so forth. But, but overall, it's still good momentum, um, you know, within the industry that uh, even if there is some negativity with that, I think it's overall positive. I seem to have a lot of things to say. Um, so there, greenwashing is absolutely rampant in the investment industry from my perspective. Um, this is, you know, not different from any other sort of classic when when capital is allocated to certain sectors, you have um, uh, a lot of enthusiasm for something because there's there are, there are returns that can be made. Um, we constantly say that the important thing is investors need to do their homework. If you want to look at greenwashing, I mean, the very first um, you know thing to look at is is uh, passively managed funds. So if you're buying ESG aware ETFs, for example, exchange traded funds, you're paying uh, extra basis points for essentially having an asset manager take out four or five um, fossil fuel heavy companies. Uh, and you're basically buying the, the same underlying index, the S&P 500 or whatever, but you're calling it an ESG aware fund. So this is a problem in the industry for sure. Um, you know, there's, there are different approaches. I think that the one that has had most success is actually in Europe when you have much stricter regulation. Um, and I think this is something that will come uh, certainly through the SEC over time, uh, but it is really a problem how you label your funds, how you label investments. Um, and, and right now it is a bit of the, you know, the, the wild west, for lack of a better expression. Uh, but I think this is sort of the fact that these conversations are having is really a testament to how much more mature the industry is getting. Um, but I think it is inevitable that we will have a wave of regulation around what you can call a green investment versus a, a non green investment. Um, unfortunately, regulation in the investment industry often lags um, a lot of uh, deep recessions and deep problems. So we'll see what happens in this particular one. I think if you wonder if your asset manager is a greenwasher or not, ask for you know hard evidence, data, not just words. And I think one thing that uh, to me is, is a good sign is corporate engagement. How much energy do they spend, you know, speaking to companies and trying to move the needle that way? There's no direct short-term financial uh, incentive there, but it shows a commitment to the issue. So, um, so that's the kind of answer you're going to see, right? Like the difference between 
uh, the perspective on greenwashing. So I want to change gears now and look at ESG frameworks. So how does an ESG framework enhance the capital asset approaches and what are the next steps to kind of further this work? And I'm just going to move to Michael. Thanks, Robert. Um, you know, as you heard from my colleagues, there's, there's different approaches to investment in these classes. It's, it's interesting, I, in preparation for my remarks today, I was looking to try and get a sense of the size of the, the market, and I understand that it's uh, about $2.7 trillion in the United States, which has an increase of about 51% in 2020. So a phenomenally fast-growing uh, sector to invest in. Um, you've heard that there's different approaches to um, what these different sort of asset classes look like. And the definition of ESG is, is obviously very broad. It's just not one definition to remove them all as we heard earlier on in the keynote remarks. That said, uh, one of the, uh, you know, my uh, sector is, is more about uh, the management of capital assets, so, you know, equipment and, and vehicles, um, not in the, in the investing side. Uh, but my understanding is, you know, a big part of that uh, is, is certainly about monitoring and managing the risk of your portfolios. And investing in an ESG uh, centered um, uh, investment strategy, I think. That's two things. It, it is certainly future proofs um, that the industries that you're you're investing in. Uh, good governance is is always its own reward. Uh, in, in Canada, we have a, a very different approach uh, than the Americans in terms of uh, board governance and fiduciary duties. So in the U.S., the approach is uh, one where to maximize uh, shareholder returns, whereas in Canada, the uh, the governance approach is what's the best interest of the, the corporation. So you're looking at a broader uh, level of stakeholders. So that approach in, in and of itself, I think. Can have some benefits. Um, additionally, uh, regulations are, are actively changing and, and disclosures that are required in companies are increasing. So, you know, putting on the ESG lens in terms of who you're investing in, uh, again, uh, sort of, uh, future proofs you in terms of sort of, you know, what the regulatory impacts of certain industries will be. And then the final thing is just sort of, you know, um, uh, tail end risks that, uh, that, that we're seeing uh, a lot of examples of, uh, you know, just in terms of sort of, you know, weather events. So, uh, you know, Personally, was caught up in Charlottetown uh, at the end of the other week uh, with Hurricane uh, Fiona, and strangely enough, I was supposed to be uh, in Florida um, at another uh, another uh, conference, and, and we had uh, Hurricane Ian. So, you know, uh, these sorts of uh, uh, weather events are absolutely impacting industries and insurance companies. And again, um, that ESG lens uh, from from an investment uh, perspective, I think, can have a huge uh, benefit, particularly in the longer term. Okay, so let's, um, I, I do want to answer a couple more questions. I know we started late, and I, I know we've rushed that panel, but it's really good that we have such a panel, such diverse opinions. So I want to talk a little bit about data and decision making around data. And then I would like to try and end and, and bring uh, Keith back on. So just end on that First Nations and reconciliation work. And, and Keith, just to prep you, you know, what more can we do as a society, whether it's First Nations, whether it's um, private sector, public sector, academia, what more can we do around truth and reconciliation with regards to our environmental, social and, and governance structures? So Keith, hopefully you can think about that one as we, um, as we go through, thank you. So the penultimate question then is, can we speak to the importance and issues uh, with respect to data around ESG. I've heard from the panel, we talk a lot about the data and the integrity of it, but um, maybe to Nicola for the first place. Yeah, I mean, uh, data is essential and there's a lot of work to be done. Um, I think it's improving, uh, particularly on the E side of ESG, but we need more standardization. Um, we're still showered with information from companies and it's not comparable. You know, so we can't evaluate companies because they're defining uh, their metrics differently, they're measuring it differently, and uh, it makes it hard for investors. So we need, we need standardization. The, uh, the ISSB uh, is promising uh, on this front. Uh, they're coming to Montreal, we're very happy about that. And, uh, and I think the regulators also have to uh, play their role in there. Uh, but 
more work to be done. Maybe I don't know, that's a little bit of a different perspective um, for a moment, not a contradiction, but just from a, another another side, and that is um, the use of data and the effective use of, of your, your assets. So we're seeing increasingly in our equipment and uh, fleet members uh, the use of uh, data to do uh, predictive repairs so the vehicles are being used more and more efficiently. And additionally, as they transition to, to greener vehicles, um, uh, and similarly, able to look at them at a broader perspective, from a fleet perspective, and then look at an individual usage, and then uh, provide that information to, to the end user and say, you know, you can use this vehicle in a different way, in a much more efficient way, both for uh, this is the use of electric vehicles, but also ISO and general combustion vehicles as well. As we tr transition away from them, we're not gonna immediately dump the ICE vehicles, we will still, have, still, we'll still have them, and using them in a much more efficient way, I think is another, another potential way to use data. So, so the only thing I'll, I'll add is, is there, there's, you know, standardization is, is good. The only drawback is innovation. So, so what I do like is things are innovating very, very quickly. I do enjoy reading lots of different ESG reports, lots of different impact reports, and they're very different in some regards. And there's a lot of different things you can learn from different managers, different investors, and there's a ton of innovation that's going on. So it is a little bit of the wild, wild west to some degree, but it is positive momentum that's occurring across across managers and, and different asset classes. And so th there's all different kinds of metrics that are coming out and things like that. And, and as an emerging manager myself, I do I do kind of like some of that to 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 there's things you can learn and adapt. And and so if you if you just have total standardization, you probably lose a little bit of the innovation. And, and certainly investors are smart and investors do appreciate the time and the energy and sort of the looking forward that companies have. And so it is an exciting space in what's going on right now. So thank you so much. So the final piece is let's come back to the topic of the reconciliation. And the, the question I posed, hopefully Kiki can and so, so talk to is what more can we do um, on this journey towards ESGs? Um, and what more can we ask of government, whether it's municipal to federal, whether it's academia, whether it's business, and that partnership? And I know you touched on it in your opening pieces, but back to you. Uh, Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Robert, for that uh, kind uh, introduction and uh, the opportunity to speak here today. And uh, I just want to briefly touch on reconciliation as an Indigenous person. So as a status Indian living here in Canada, I am considered a, a legal ward of the state. And what that means is I'm a child in the eyes of the federal government. And uh, there's uh, 634 Indigenous communities across Canada that are uh, uh, made up uh, uh, as reserves and reserves are plots of land that are reserved for the right or for the use of uh, 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 status Indians. And that's governed by the Indian Act, which is one of the most racist pieces of legislation in the world. And uh, I think you can make uh, uh, the, uh, um, I guess the, uh, there's other legislation in other parts of the world uh, that, uh, uh, South Africa that had the Apartheid Act, uh, a number of other places that had other legislation. So, uh, you know, as Indigenous peoples, we're late to the game. And uh, as, as a, a, for instance, in, in my uh, part of uh, Canada, uh, central part of British Columbia, the last residential school was closed down in the mid-1970s in the early 1960s uh, because our kids were forced to attend the residential school systems across Canada, we had one high school graduate in my community. So, you know, for us, we're playing a catch up game with all of the uh, people up front with all due respect to uh, everyone there. Uh, we we, uh, we uh, closed down those residential schools in my territory the Camel Indian Residential School in the mid 1970s. And uh, both of my parents went to the Camel Indian Residential School in Kamloops. Both of my parents made it to grade eight. Uh, my mom was uh, taught to be a homemaker. My dad was taught to be a uh, rancher. And uh, 
you know, uh, we've been playing catch up ever since. So just a, a little bit of history, a little bit more history. Um, we, uh, uh, we, need, we need our young people to occupy uh, all of the uh, financial institutions and all of the organizations that are up front. And, uh, you know, for, for my community, we have one of the highest uh, uh, graduation rates uh, for high school in any uh, school district in British Columbia. And uh, just 30 years ago, our, our uh, graduation rate for high school students was around the provincial average of uh, 48%. Today, it's up around 80%. So we've got uh, a really well-educated uh, workforce as a result. We've got doctors, we've got uh, lawyers, we've got people with uh, doctorates, masters, all sorts of uh, other opportunities for educating themselves. But we do need uh, help from all of the institutions in Canada to occupy the different uh, opportunities that are out there for all of us. So it, when you talk about reconciliation, I want to change the makeup of that panel that you have up front there. I want to see more of my people there. I really do. Uh, and uh, that's, that's something I want to leave you with. Thank you very much. Cook Shem, all my relations. So um, thank you, Keith, for, for those words. And I think that's a really important way to finish. And I don't believe that we've been finishing quite like that um, on these previous sessions. And this is really important. Um, so Keith, I want to echo your words there that we have more to do. Um, and we can keep going and to do that. So thank you so much. Um, so you know, I want to say thank you to all of the, the panel members. You know, we started late and we called up time. But I think what we've got here today is a snippet of both the intelligence, the momentum, the integration, the collaboration that's required, um, both in, in this ESG as well as in whatever form that we see it in our, in our role um, in, um, in terms of our reconciliation as, as, as all of us as custodians in this, in this wonderful country. So we've heard about assets, we've heard about decarbonization, there's an importance around metrics and targets, there's an importance about the people though, that who are we trying to look for? and how we're encouraging businesses, governments, academia to put this at the forefront. Um, I really, really like the concept when we talked about the question of greenwashing and the challenge and the difference um, in the answers there. So what you can take from this is it's not exact yet. It's been going a long time. And I think we're making a momentum. And one of the panelists said it, we're making that momentum. It's getting better. Um, so I would love to keep this panel, uh, keep and everybody here uh, in person for another couple of hours. I really would. I think we could get more from this. Um, so what I will do is I'll take this away and I'll help um, the conference form the resolution notes for tomorrow and see how we can take this a step further. So I really want to thank all of the panel um, and to, to Keith virtually um, and, to, and thanks to the, to the forum for, for hosting us.